Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Tonight's show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. By the way, thanks so much for supporting the audio version of uh, Deconverted. It's uh, about five hours long, and it's just a pleasure to know that people are getting encouragement from the audiobook. Just think of it as a long podcast, okay? Uh, you can find it. In fact, you can get a, a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook. Go to audibletrial.com slash the thinking atheist. Tonight's show is called I Am an Ex-Muslim. And over the course of the next hour and a half or so, we're going to hear some fascinating accounts from people all around the world who left Islam and faced a variety of different and often serious consequences for doing so. An article that came out just a few years ago in USA Today says that the Pew Forum on Religion has the global Muslim population right now at about one and a half billion, meaning that on planet Earth, nearly one in four practice Islam, the number two religion behind Christianity. In Arabic, the term Islam means submission. It comes from the term Islama, which means to surrender or to resign one's self. In the religion of Islam, it is your duty, the duty of each Muslim, to submit to Allah, which is Arabic for the God, and do whatever Allah wants. A person who follows Islam is called a Muslim. Muslim means one who surrenders to God. So you can see already it's a culture of submission to the wills and commands of God. Many proponents of Islam say that Islam actually means peace. And in fact, the Arabic word Islam is related to the Syriac Aslam, which means to make peace. But critics say that don't forget, peace is inextricably intertwined with submission and surrender to the wills and desires and the commands of Allah. Meaning that, yes, we'll have peace, but only if all submit to Islam. So what is the religion of Islam? Well, it's a monotheistic and Abrahamic religion represented by the Quran, their holy book. A book considered by its adherents to be the absolute perfect and verbatim word of God. And they hold to the teachings and example of the last prophet of God, who is Muhammad. They believe that Islam has been represented throughout history. Even in other faiths, which have sort of screwed it up, misinterpreted it, it's been altered over time, but the Arabic Quran is still the perfect, unaltered, and final revelation of God. Their religious practices include things like the five pillars of Islam. And these five pillars make up Muslim life. They are, number one, declaring there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Two, ritual prayer. They must pray five times every day. Three, they must fast and use self-control during the month of Ramadan. Number four, giving two and a half percent of their savings to the poor and the needy. And number five, at least once in a lifetime, if they're able to do so, they must make the pilgrimage to Mecca. Most Muslims fall under two denominations. The Sunni Muslim, which is the vast majority as I understand it, like up to 90%. 75 to 90 percent is the ratio, and then the Shia Muslim, 10 to 20 percent. 13 percent of Muslims live in Indonesia, 25 percent in South Asia, 15 percent in Sub-Saharan Africa. You'll find minorities of Muslims in Europe, China, Russia, and in the Americas. In fact, you'll find converts and immigrant communities in almost every parts of the world. If you do any research 
or reading or listening or watching the uh, testimonies of people who've walked away from this faith, you'll find that the consequences for doing so can be significant and severe. My first call tonight from a gentleman named Imad. And Imad, thanks for being here. Where are you calling from? I am from Morocco. I grew up in Casablanca. You were once a person who believed the Quran. You believed in Allah. It was more like a popular song that everybody sings and you hear it everywhere. And you're trying to convince yourself with it. You're trying to love it. But at a certain point, when you get and some people got some strange to reject it and say to everybody else, I don't like this song. It's just the same with Quran and with religion. In my view. Were you afraid to tell anyone that you didn't want to sing the song anymore? Was it scary to you? Well, I learned in a Quranic school. So we were learning Quran by heart. And I never felt something special or something sacred or spiritual about it. It was just the words that everybody uh, listen, listens to. It never affected me, actually. I prayed constantly for many years, and I went to the mosque, and I fasted. But I was never convinced, and the more I grew up, the more I rejected Islam and its uh, commandments. Beginning from when I had, like, 12 years old, I became to question and to read Quran in, in a septic perspective. And then it falls over and it takes me like two years to tell my parents who were really pissed off and totally against. <laughs> they were upset with you. They were angry. How did you tell them? Yeah. Did you just sit them down and say, mom and dad, I don't believe or what? No, it was problems because I, I was, I stopped praying. I began to question things that it's not good to to, to question uh, as a Muslim, as for, for them, we had a fight and then I said, I, I don't believe anymore. And it was like, because I'm from the golden line or golden progenies of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, it's really religious and people like kiss our hands and respect us because we are from the, the progenies of Muhammad. And then it's really shameful for them to reject Islam as one who, who should, for them, represent Islam and represent the prophet of Islam, Muhammad. Do your parents treat you differently? Do you feel a difference in the way you relate to your mother and father? Yes, yes. Uh, my relation just go worse and worse since I told them so. I was always the um, uh, unloved and the less preferred of, among my brother and sisters. But I think I was uh, strong enough to survive all this. I keep hearing all of these emergency sirens in the background. I think that I hope that there's yeah. not a, a car accident right outside your window, my friend. <laughs> oh, I think that this microphone is really sensitive it's really because sensitive. I hear it's really, really sensitive. On this side, it sounds like you're calling me from a crime scene. So I just had to ask. <laughs> I'm just glad you're safe over there. <laughs> now you're calling me from a like a public cafe area that has Wi-Fi, right? Or no, no, no. I'm, I'm on the tenth floor. You're on the tenth floor of, and, and it's outside in the street. I don't know how the sound just gets. I'm just glad. So I'm just well. wanted to. I'm glad you're okay, my friend. I don't know much about Morocco. When I think of Morocco, I think of tourism, and I think of you know the, this beautiful place we often will see in the movies. But I don't know much about Morocco. That's what what the government wants you to to see about Morocco, but it's more like any other Islamic country. It is censorship everywhere. It's a police state where everybody is uh, watching. They're watching you. They're jailing activists. Repression. Everything but, but a democracy here. As for me, there was an interview in the first, uh, in the most popular uh, electronic magazine in Morocco, in Arabic, and I said that Quran was a man-made fantasy for me, of course, and it was a lot of traits, and I received more than thousands of 
threats and thousands of insults and uh, police just came the day after to my house and fortunately I wasn't there so I'm always worried because Islamists here have, are in, a, in the power in the government and even extremists or Salafists are now they, we can see them in the, in the television and in the radio and it, it wasn't like that in Morocco in the 80s or the 70s people didn't wear hijab really didn't show the beards and the Islamic things but uh, things are raising the, the Islamic uh, movement is, is, is rising in Morocco and that's scary that's why we have to, to show up and we have to fight in, in order to fight the Islamism and the extremism well, how are you blogging under your real name? Anybody can find you. Anybody can track you down. Anybody can arrest you. And that's the point because when when I begin to blog in, in my name, there was so many people that contacted me because they saw a picture, they saw a real name, someone who walks the roads, someone who is living in Morocco, and that's giving confidence and self confidence. So I was contacted by so many atheists from Morocco and I never believed that there was as many atheists in Morocco. So they contact me, they know that I am here for them. So you're saying, Imad, that there is a big undercurrent of skepticism, of non-belief, of, of people who want to speak out and who want to say, I don't believe, but they are afraid to. And your voice and voices like yours are giving them courage. Indeed, and when I was kicked out from my parental house because of the police and problems, etc., and I survived because of all the messages I got from people from Morocco with Islamic names, from popular families that told me that I was their voice. They thank me for, for what I do and respect me for this. And it was like the strength that I, that I need to carry on my fight as militant atheist. Here in the last place where you think that there's militant atheism. Be safe over there, my friend. And I thank you so much for educating us about you and your situation. And and I don't know about you, but I'm going to keep plugging away and working for a better world. I know you're doing the same. You be safe over there, okay? Thank you. Thank you a lot. I had a letter in from someone who asked that I keep their identity secret. The letter goes like this. I'm an ex-Muslim. I'm from Malaysia. Pardon me for my bad English. It's only my second language that's barely spoken. To begin, let me tell you about the religious climate of my country. Malaysia is a rather beautiful country with almost 30 million in population. And you can slice it into three major races or ethnicities. 60% Malay, more than 20% Chinese, 7% Indians, and the rest comprised of many others, including Aborigines. And now for the interesting part. The official religion, whatever that means, is Islam. And it's also the religion of the majority race, the Malays. You see, we have a terrible mix-up between race and religion. Every Malay, I'm included, is dictated by some unspoken law of unknown source to be born a Muslim. From day one, Islam is our religion, as evidently printed on our national ID card, and good luck on trying to erase it later on in life. This might not be very apparent with the Chinese and Indians, though. The Chinese are either Buddhist or Christian, while the Indians, they can be Hindus or Christians. The Malays, while maintaining the majority status, are actually losing out to other races in terms of economics, education, and quality of life. The thought of a Malay who's leaving Islam simply won't process in their heavily indoctrinated brains, forcing people like me to face their shit every day. The Malays shamelessly appointed themselves as the boss above others, and Islam is put in an untouchable position. Being the majority, carrying the title of the official religion, somehow has them fooled into thinking they deserve this special position. To me, it's more like overcompensating for the other aspects of life that they're lacking. And the supreme ruler, the sultan, he has their backs too. Also untouchable. And then there's the Allah issue. 
What started as a political rhetoric to gain votes in the 2013 general election has escalated to a nationwide battle of the religion's absurdity. It made headlines that Christians in East Malaysia were using the word Allah to refer to the Father, and they're distributing the Bible in the Malay language translation with the word Allah in it. This, as expected, has triggered an explosive reaction of foul crying and high-pitched squealing among the Malays in the West Peninsula. It appears that those Christians in the East were Malay-speaking people, and they've always used the word since their existence. That's just who they are. The ignorance of the Malays about this fact disgusts every other people around them. They're claiming that the word is exclusive for Muslim use. They're calling for the ban of the word among Christians. Another fact ignored is that the word Allah in Arabic simply means the God. Their reason for opposing was that they were worried the use of the word might cause confusion among Muslims, as might cause some of them to lose faith in Islam. Can you believe that? That's how insecure they are. It's like the British banning the U.S. for using the word football for the wrong sport. Worrying the British kids who are aspiring to be a football player will get confused. On another note, Muslims here are even prohibited to greet people of other faiths for their celebrations, such as Christmas or Diwali for the Hindus. The gesture is interpreted as a nod to their belief of the wrong God. As frustrated as I am with what my country has become politically, it's not enough to mask the bigger frustration about the reality of living as an ex-Muslim in this country. I left Islam five years ago, and I still haven't come out to anybody at all, except my wife. I'm still thankful for that. But I believe my wife's acceptance only comes from her trust she puts in me, not from proper understanding. That kind of worries me. She comes from a simple family who are deeply religious, but the type which only heavily enforce the obligatory ritual aspects, the do's and don'ts, instead of the knowledge and spiritual side. I'm living with my wife and a three-year-old daughter, but that doesn't mean I'm free from religious pressure. It's different here compared to the Western countries with free speech and all. Everything we do is judged through the religious glasses, not only by family, but also the neighbors and everyone around us who are Malays or Muslims. That means I still have to remember the obligatory daily five prayers, have to appear to pray in front of others at work which is a 100% Malay company, I have to keep reminding myself which direction from my house Mecca is in case my family drops by, asking, how do they pray from here? I can't go to the store to purchase bacon from the non-halal section without raising many eyebrows. I still have to remember how to read the Quran in the foreign ancient Arabic language fluently. Whenever situations call for me to recite in front of or along with others in special occasions. I'll be deemed bad if I'm not able to, which is a big issue. I have to be seen going to the mosque every Friday or shut all doors and windows and stay still inside so that nobody will notice that I'm at home, preventing the news to break to family. Simply because I'm a Malay, I must be a Muslim. So what's the big deal if my family finds out? You see, if Islam claims itself to be the way of life, whatever we do, we carry Islam's brand with us. The whole society is watching. Being an apostate means I have to be put to death. But I know my parents won't have the heart to do that, even if it's what Islam tells them to do. But this will put them in tremendous depression, driven by dilemmas and guilt. Me going to hell is one thing. My daughter, whom they love very much, will also be going to hell. And another thing in Islam is that children are considered assets for afterlife. They can pray for their parents to assist their journey to paradise once they're dead. It's like the children are helping to keep adding bonus points on top of the total points accumulated during their parents' life until it is enough for the parents to afford the paradise entrance fee. The reason being, the more devout a Muslim is, the more anxious he gets about not fulfilling his duties for God in his lifetime. So having a lot of good, devout children means more manpower to do the patchwork. 
And now you know why there are so many big Muslim families bearing double-digit numbers of children, even some only living under a shed. So what if I'm their son, the atheist? What does that mean? Well, it means I won't be able to pay my parents' afterlife dividends, and they'll have the bigger responsibility of going to hell, too. That's how Islam gets you and your whole family chain. Thank you so much for the message. My next guest on tonight's show, Mohammed Syed, Director of Operations for an organization and website called the Ex-Muslims of North America. Mohammed, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having us, Ed. I, coming from the Bible Belt of the United States of America, Protestant Christianity everywhere, I can't really speak to Islam, especially in the way that many people who come from Islam can't. And that's what the purpose of this show is, just to get perspectives of people who can give us the inside-out details. You came from the Muslim faith, correct? Yes, that's correct. And how did you bust out, and when did it happen? About six, seven years ago, I had a few friends that went fundamentalist Muslim. And as a result, I started investigating Islam in more detail, reading the scriptures and the background text of it. And the more you read it, the more obvious it is that a lot of the stories that make up the faith itself are mythology. Like, Pegasus is actually referenced in the Quran. The winged horse Pegasus is in the Quran? <laughs> it's named differently, but it's the same kind of thing. Muhammad had a horse. It was more of a mule that he flew to heaven to meet God on. What else did you find in the Quran that didn't make sense to you? So a lot of Muslims like to pitch the line that um, Islam is very forward and progressive regarding women's rights. But within the Quran, sex slavery is sanctioned. Beating women is sanctioned. Women are very clearly relegated to a second-class citizen status. There are verses about men have been given preference over women, and women are deficient in intelligence. Where were you born? Where are you from? I was born in the U.S. My parents migrated here, but I moved back to Pakistan as a kid. I spent a good chunk of my childhood in Pakistan. Is it true that Islam wants to take over the world? Because that's sort of a recurring thing I'm always hearing. Is Islam designed to globally dominate? Um, I think if you look at any faith, including Islam, the idea is that our way is the right way, whatever faith you're looking at. And everybody should follow this way. So proselytizing is a big part of Islam. Trying to expand the reach of Islam is a, a big thing. It also goes to how liberal or conservative a Muslim you are. A good chunk, I would say the vast majority of Muslims want to return to the caliphate, for example. And that's, uh, there's a good deal of romanticism. I wouldn't frame it in the way of taking over the world. It, I would frame it more that they view it as saving the world. We want to uh, rescue the unwashed masses and destroy the infidel. Is that an exactly. accurate way to say it? Exactly. Talk to me about how Islam approaches the non-believer. I know one of the worst things ever is to be the apostate, right? That's yeah. even worse than being a lifelong non-believer. To be an apostate is the ultimate insult, correct? Exactly, because you actually understood what the faith was and rejected it summarily after accepting it. That is a far worse sin. Um, regarding how they treat people that are non-Muslim, there are various degrees. So people of Abrahamic faith are regarded as being better than people, say, if you're a Hindu or from any other faith. Because they identify with the same God, uh, Yahweh to Allah is a continuation from a Muslim perspective. But Hindus and polytheistic gods are regarded as being far inferior. For example, in marital rights, a Muslim man can marry a Christian or a Jewish woman. But Hindus and uh, Buddhists uh, and atheists are off limits. Regarding apostasy, for example, there's clear-cut instructions that if somebody leaves religion, they should be killed. These executions, what are they come to your house and say you've been accused of being an apostate and they drag your ass out to the middle of a square somewhere and stone you to death or hang you or what are we talking about? Usually, no, like um, that may happen in Saudi Arabia, but in most other countries, it's more you get a trial. But ultimately, there's very little evidence you can. How do you prove a negative that you're actually not an ex-Muslim or not an apostate? One guy recently, uh, Ben Bazaziz, um, he's from Kuwait. He was arrested for promoting secularism and thrown in jail in Kuwait for a year. Things like that are fairly common in Muslim countries where uh, you can be accused of promoting a non-Islamic agenda and be punished for it. In certain countries, blasphemy is punishable by death. Pakistan is one of those countries. So it varies country to country. By the way, I do have a letter from Ben who you just referenced coming up on the show as he sort of describes how he was imprisoned. And uh, it's a fascinating story great, and a kind yeah. of a tragic one. But uh, 
he obviously free now. He sent us the story, and I'm going to share it with you in just a little bit here. Is Islam a different animal? I mean, some people are quick to say two things when we address issues like this. First of all, if you speak negatively against Islam, you're a racist. And of course, I always have to stop them <laughs> and say, Islam is not a race. Is this a common thing where you are from? People are sort of timid about criticizing for fear of being labeled by someone elsewhere as a racist? Yes, we actually have been called racist and bigots for being ex-Muslims. The word ex-Muslim is offensive to people. Um, our existence is offensive to people. So the way we make a distinction is that, like, you've probably heard of the word Islamophobia. Yes. So what it's trying to encapsulate is uh, bigotry towards people that hail from Muslim regions, be it Middle East, be it North Africa, South Asia. That's an actual phenomenon, and, and that occurs in America and Europe. But the way it's phrased, Islamophobia, is nonsensical. Islam is an ideology. You can criticize an ideology and that is not bigotry. The way we prefer phrasing it is Muslimophobia. You're phobic towards the people, Muslims, which is an issue that we all should fight against, but we should also all reserve the right to be able to criticize an ideology, which would be Islam. You can have a disagreement on principle exactly. without demeaning or um, acting in a hateful or bigoted way toward the people who hold those beliefs. I think it's very important that we make that distinction because a lot of Muslims try to blur the line because... Criticizing Islam is something they're not used to and there's something that they do not tolerate. So it needs to be clarified by everybody that we're not criticizing Muslims, we're criticizing the ideology behind Islam. Islam is free for all. Everybody should point out the logical inconsistencies and the immoral aspects of it. But we should not be attacking any specific individuals. That's a convenient deflection point, isn't it? If I hold a belief that is an offensive belief and you come after me, well, I just play the racism card, right? I can exactly. paint you as a racist to minimize you right off the bat. Exactly. And the other side is that they specifically want that because it allows them to say the world is against them. There's a huge victim complex issue going on where the West or everybody else is against them and we have to stick together within our community or within our whatever our spheres we are in. I want to address a very sensitive issue that Islam is sort of a different animal. I mean, we're out there talking against superstitious nonsense, you know, mythology and false history, pseudoscience, all that stuff. But with Islam, especially in the headlines, we get the impression that this is something different. This isn't just a belief system that someone cherishes and holds dear. But this is, in many countries, in many forms, a steamroller. It's violent, it is destructive, it is filled with vitriol. This is what we often perceive. Is that accurate? Would you like to address that? In a way, it's accurate, but if you look at the bigger picture, all religions have had that phase. Islam is, I would say, where in like 13th, 14th century Christianity was. If you criticize certain aspects, you would be killed, you would be tortured. If you look at scripturally, they're not that different. The thing is, the scriptures are still taken seriously in most Muslim countries and most Muslim people. If you talk to them about the Quran itself, it is the literal word of God. So saying anything against it is actually saying something against God himself. On the other hand, when Ken Ham talks about a 6,000-year-old earth, most Christians do not agree with that and most would laugh at him. Well, I think that speaks to my larger point. Right now, Islam seems to be the one religious force out there that seems to be the most dangerous. I'm not sure what the whole spectrum of religions, but it is one of the biggest threats out there in the sense that it is holding over a billion people enslaved from a GDP perspective, from a human rights perspective, from a women's rights perspective. All of these nations are being retarded because of their belief in this Iron Age mythology, Bronze Age mythology. Humanity has advanced beyond that morality. Do you see any signs of hope? Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel here? I mean, is there a way that this can be overcome? I think largely it's about education and standing the line in the sense that if somebody, so in uh, the Old Testament, for example, there's a line about if your wife is not a virgin, you take her to her father's doorstep and stone her to death. If any Jewish person says that today, Jews would think they're crazy. The same needs to happen within Islam. And we have a part to play in that where we need to point out that it doesn't matter what the Quran says or what other scriptural elements say, this is immoral and this is wrong. And over time, that will penetrate. What we're hoping, what we as ex-Muslims in North America are doing is we're trying to build a support community within the U.S. and Canada. And we're hoping to change attitudes towards apostasy and towards criticizing religion within Muslim communities. And over time, we hope that that will percolate back to mid the Middle East and South Asia as well. It's not something we hear about often in the news. We see Islam represented in you know, the Arabic countries, other parts of the world. You don't hear about it much in North America. Is there a large Muslim and ex-Muslim present here in the States? 
there is a large Muslim presence and I believe there's a large ex-Muslim presence. The problem with ex-Muslims is because the consequences of leaving religion and being public about it can be so severe. Most people don't verbalize it. When I left religion, I was told by my friends that say you're a non-practicing Muslim, that's the easy route to take instead of being intellectually honest and saying this is what I believe and why I believe what I believe. I'm sure like you've probably read about the rise of the nuns that's been happening where a good chunk of America is becoming secular and atheist. The same thing is happening within Muslim communities in the West as well. We just need to provide them the mechanism to be able to take advantage of them and actually walk out. A lot of people that are in our group are, for example, dependent upon their parents. And if they know that there are other people like them out there, just having that knowledge goes a long way. And then having a community that can support you and will help you get out also goes a long way. I think it's a generational shift, but it will happen. Visit the website, ex-Muslims of North America. It is E-X-M as in Mary, N as in Nancy, A, E-X-M-N-A dot org, correct? Yes, that's correct. Is it a safe haven for people who want to come out of Islam and are scared, or maybe they have and they're flying under the radar? What's the purpose of the website? First off, it's about educating people about what we are doing. And the other thing is that people that want to join, they contact us. And we have a fairly rigorous screening process before letting people in. So we have safe spaces set up in about a dozen cities right now. And we have uh, monthly or more frequent meetups. And we make sure that everybody's security and privacy, like that's our prime directive, if you will. Because I would say 70% of our members are in the closet. And if their identities are compromised, that would lead to lots of blowback. So we're hoping to provide a mechanism for anybody that wants to be a part of an ex-Muslim community to contact us. Mohammed Sayed of the Ex-Muslims of North America. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes to educate us today and for being a part of the podcast. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much for having me. The Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain recently posted a report called The Political and Legal Status of Apostates in Islam. They teamed up with Atheist Alliance International to put this new report together that essentially talks about what the status is of apostates from Islam. And it was given support of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Now, it's a big report, and I certainly don't have time to read it all here. I will link it in the description box of this video. I'm going to have a lot of links in there today. But I'll just read this portion from the report. I think it's very telling. It says this, Punishing apostates is a long-standing and fundamental feature of all major religions. Repudiating religion is deemed to be the worst of crimes. In the 21st century, however, it is only apostates from Islam that continue to face execution. This is because of the political Islamic movement's power and influence. This far-right movement is this era's inquisition and totalitarianism. To the degree political Islam or Islamism has power, that is the degree it controls every single aspect of people's lives and society via its Sharia law. From what people wear, who they have sex with, what music they listen to, even what they're allowed to think. One of the characteristics of an inquisition is the policing of thought. Free thinking and freedom of conscience are banned. Even for Muslims, a personal religion, quote-unquote personal religion, is impossible under an inquisition. You can't pick and choose as you'd like. Any transgression is met with threats, intimidation, imprisonment, or execution. Islamists will kill, threaten, or intimidate anyone who interprets things differently, dissents, thinks freely, or transgresses their norms. Of course people resist day in and day out. But that is a testament to the human spirit, despite Islamism and Sharia. If you look at the purpose of the Sharia, quote, justice system, it is there to teach the masses the damnable nature of dissent and free thought. Where it has power, like in Iran, there are 130 offenses punishable by death, from heresy, blasphemy, enmity against God, adultery, and homosexuality. Apostasy, however, is the highest and most heinous crime. Twenty-seven countries consider apostasy from Islam illegal and a prosecutable offense. Depending on the influence of Islamism and Sharia law in places like Malaysia, which we just mentioned, Morocco, Jordan, and Oman punishments vary from fines, imprisonment, flogging, and exclusion from civil or family rights 
In 11 countries, apostasy is punishable by the death penalty. And while there are religious justifications for the execution of apostates, apostasy laws today under the Islamic Inquisition are the ultimate means of political rather than religious control. Certainly from a religious standpoint, apostasy is the unraveling of the entire system from within by those considered to be its members, the members of the imagined Muslim community. Question one law, one hadith, the sayings and actions of Muhammad, Islam's prophet, and one surah in the Quran, and you'll begin to unravel it all. To question and dissent denies the Islamic inquisitor the opportunity to feign representation, and it prevents the submission that they demand. If you are allowed to leave, you undermine it all. As a leading Egyptian cleric who supports the killing of apostates has said, quote, if they left apostasy alone, there wouldn't have been any Islam. My next letter is by someone who left Islam and dared to challenge it publicly and paid a penalty for doing so. You may have heard his name out there in the blogosphere. He's got a very popular blog, which I will link in the description box of this video. Bin Baz Aziz says this, Thanks for caring to spread the message and my case and why I was jailed. My name is Aziz Bin Baz. Is it Bin Baz Aziz? I see it both ways, back and forth. I'm naturally Egyptian, born in Kuwait, and lived there most of my life. Before I went to jail, accused of blasphemy. Islam is lame, so I never was a practicing Muslim. But being raised in a conservative family, that will affect and Islamicize your way of thinking. Islam forces parents to raise children in a certain way and hit them if they don't pray. Islam forces them to make their daughters wear the hijab. Even the subjects at school put hatred inside your heart toward non-Muslims. They destroy your logical thinking by forcing you to study religion as a pure fact. Why did I leave Islam? There are too many reasons to name. Islam is lame. No one single piece of logical evidence on the relation between Islam and God. Muhammad was a rural, ignorant person that used more ignorant Bedouin persons living in the desert that God sent with him with a message to rule the whole earth and invade non-believers and steal them and arrest men and women and use them as slaves and promise them they would go to heaven where they'd find warm weather and plenty of food and hot women instead of hot weather. Islam spreads by invasion and war, and I never chose to be a Muslim. Muhammad sent to all states around him letters forcing them to be Muslims, or he would fight them. I left Islam as I felt shame of being Muslim, and I was not convinced by the Quran's logic. It's such an ugly book full of torture verses and hatred and God helping Muhammad in his sexual desires, a book full of scientific mistakes. For example, it says that sperm comes from the backbone. The consequences for me being a non-believer? I had many problems with family and society, so I lived alone and moved between many places. Once the wrong persons know that you are an atheist, you'll face much hatred and many problems. And the worst happened when I was jailed because of blasphemy. I was a blogger and a presenter at Arab Atheist Broadcasting and a writer at I Think Magazine. So I was sentenced for a year as I talked about secularism and made some sarcastic remarks about fundamentals. Please check my Twitter account to see my name and my court papers. And he actually lists the Twitter. It's B-E-N-B-A-Z-A-Z-I-Z, -Z -Z, Ben Baz Aziz. They violated my right to express myself and destroyed my whole life. I lost a year of my life and my place of residence and job and money and almost everything. Now I live in Egypt, but the same laws exist here also. I will seek to leave very soon. Next up on the switchboard is Ruby. Ruby, glad you're here. It's a pleasure to have you on tonight's show. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here with you, Seth. I had the privilege of meeting you when I was doing my Arizona tour stop last weekend. And as yes. we spoke, I realized you would be perfect for this particular podcast. Very quickly, can you tell me about your background? Where are you from? 
Yeah, I'm a Kuwaiti. I came from Kuwait about 2008. Were you a believer in the Quran? Were you an adherent to Islam? Ah, yes, definitely. I was a believer in Islam all my life. Like any other Muslim, I didn't see any reason why not to believe. I was brought up as a Shiite Muslim, and my kind of Islam, because every sect is different than the other, even in my sect there are different versions of Islam. So my version was more of peace and love, and uh, like uh, it's called the Irfan, which is more like Sufism. Sufism actually is, for those who don't know, is like dissolving oneself and the Creator and becoming one. So actually, when you talk to your creator, you are doing it from the heart as if you're talking to a loved one. So to me, there was no reason not to believe. Well, if this is a peaceful culture and it's about love and joy, how did you yeah. one day find yourself under house arrest at the yeah. behest of your husband and the religious court? Can you tell me that story in a nutshell? Yeah, this was actually one part of a whole process that I went through. It wasn't only the the court order that made me leave my religion. Actually, the court order and other stuff to me was like uh, just Muslims not interpreting the scripture the right way. So to well, me, we'll start at the beginning, Ruby. I'm sorry, I want to make sure I'm clear. So I'm, I want to start at the beginning. How did this story begin? Your husband and you were not in a good place and you had asked for a divorce. I mean, tell me the story in a nutshell. The story is that I had problems with my husband for a long time. Then when one day I decided I cannot take it anymore, I go to the court to file a divorce. The court will not grant me the divorce because I cannot, as a woman, I cannot file a divorce even. So he has, the man has the right to file a divorce even without the presence of his wife, and he can be granted. But a woman cannot do that. So the judge, actually it's a religious judge, because for civil services uh, courts, we have only religious courts. We don't have secular courts. So this was a Shia court, where he told me, what's the problem? He's not paying your expenses. Says, I didn't want him to pay the expenses. This is not the reason why I want that. But you have to understand that in Islamic culture, women are sold and bought. So as long as he's paying your expenses as a woman, it's okay. The Sharia court did not recognize your voice because you were a female. Yes, of course. And what he did, he filed another case against me, which was wife disobedience. And he got it right away because I was out of his house, our house, but I was out and that was held against me. I'm sorry, so what do you he, mean by out of the house? Were you out walking around without his permission no, I, no, or no. had you left the home? Yeah, I left the home and I went and lived on my own in a different apartment. And because of that, he wait. took you to court and you were placed under a kind of house arrest? Yes for life. It's called the house of Ta'a, which means house of obedience, which means I have to be in the house and I cannot go outside of my door except when I get his permission. Under his permission, okay. He has to know where my whereabouts. And also, I cannot leave the country. That's another thing. That's why when this court order was out, I had to flee the country before my name goes to the border because I wasn't even sure, even when I was leaving the country, I wasn't sure that my name would be on their computer or not. When you were under house arrest, Ruby, what's going on in your mind? Is it just rage at the injustice of being imprisoned by your own spouse in this hugely misogynistic court system? What what are you thinking? Actually, I was thinking of how unjust Islam is to women. All my life, I'm an engineer. I work for all my life, and I'm not only an engineer. Actually, I was a manager. There were 50 people underneath me that I was managing, and I couldn't even decide a simple thing in my life. My freedom, my passport was expired. I went to change the expiration date, and they told me, you cannot do that. You have to have your husband coming. 
and doing this for you. I mean, even simple things like this, I couldn't take care of. I had to reconsider and restudy my religion. I always thought that this was Muslims mispracticing the religion because to me, religion was much beyond that. But when I went inside and read into the religion, into the scripture, the, the biography of Muhammad, the Quran, and other original books, and the tradition, I realized that it was even much more worse than the practice. I went and tried to read the Quran, which to me was letters from my beloved. When I read it, my hand and whole body shook. I couldn't read it critically. I had to get an English translation to be able to see exactly what it means. It wasn't just one day or one thing. It was the whole process. It took me maybe over four or five years until I lost my religion. Then it took science. I read Richard Dawkins and Stephen Hawkins and Lawrence Krauss to make me also give up the idea of God. Education led to your liberation, yes? I educated myself, yes. The education that I had from schooling and from the media, it didn't help me. It helped me to do, be somebody in my life, to have a salary and have good name, but it didn't help me to reform myself. That's why you have a lot of doctors, you have a lot of engineers, but they still live in the fantasy. So you decided, I'm going to flee the country. I'm going to flee and find my freedom elsewhere. Did you leave at night? Did you leave while your husband was away? What happened? Actually, I didn't obey the court order. So the court order was out, and I still was doing my thing. And my husband knew that I was traveling for my kids to visit only, you know, because they were studying in the States anyway. But that was about like a month later, but I kind of changed the date the soonest. It was about a couple of days because I didn't want the war to go into the computer system and then it will go to the border so I can't I and then I will be returned if the name is there. Okay, well so, let me make uh, sure I understand, yeah. Ruby. Let me make sure I understand. So yeah. you had children studying in the United States and so yeah, two boys. you declared that you were going to be traveling visiting the USA to visit your children. So I had I had the ticket. Okay. I had the ticket. But from you, school. Yeah. you were secretly planning to stay. You weren't planning to yes. come back. You said, I'll be gone for a short while. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. No, 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 no. That was after a month. But I changed the date. He didn't know that I was leaving. I see. So when I left, he didn't know. That was about two days after I saw the court order. I called the airline, the British airline, and I told them I need this change to as fast as possible. And it was a couple of days. So I take that and I leave without anybody knowing. My husband was out doing his business somewhere. So you so just never I, came I, back. I, I mean, he just never yeah, saw I, you again. <laughs> yeah, he, he, when he came, he never saw me. But the thing is, until the last minute at the airport, when the guy was, the custom guy was looking, the security was looking into the computer, I was so scared that he would tell me that you cannot travel. Even when I went to London, I was like, the entry pole is going to be behind me, you know, wow. or looking for me or something. You know, I had all kinds of ideas. I wasn't free until I went to New York airport. You know, when I landed there, I was like, okay, now I'm free. <laughs> well, Ruby, what are you now? I mean, you're no longer a practicing Muslim. You don't believe in the Koran. Are you another religion? Are you an atheist? What are you? You know, there is a lot of things attached to atheism. That's why maybe I'm not very comfortable with the name. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't have any religion and I don't believe in God. I believe in science. I believe in natural things, you know, that I believe that something could come out of nothing, as Stephen Hawkins mentioned. I'm a blogger, by the way. I did a 10-page review of his book, Stephen Hawkins' book in Arabic, and I'm posting them in different social networks. Do you think there are so people I, who are now in Muslim cultures who are reading the work and a review of Stephen Hawking's work because of your blog? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Somebody actually got in touch with me, and they want to have it published on paper. Well, that's exciting. So, um, You've got people yeah. in Muslim cultures talking about science instead of the Quran. Oh, yes. That's pretty amazing. 
Oh, yes. Islam is deteriorating, or the idea of God in general is deteriorating within the Islamic culture itself. The problem is the West is not the East. The East, as you see with the spring revolutions and this, it's bubbling up, and a lot of atheists are coming out of the region. The problem is the European countries. Islam, as I think it, yeah, it was the letter to a Christian nation. It was written in 2006 by Sam Harris. He said that in 25 years, the way the Muslims, with the birth rate, the rate of the birth rate among Muslims is three times of non-Muslims. That means in 25 years, you're going to have a majority of Muslims. Now look what they're doing in France and England. It's really pathetic. It's scary. What you're doing, what others are doing, what I am writing now a book to show Islam and what it is and what it has done. I'm telling only my own experiences. I don't want these people, especially in Europe, the ones that have not been stung by the Sharia courts, to know what they're getting themselves into. These people think of Islam as a utopian world where there is, cannot be any thing wrong with it. It's infallible. But it's not. You should look at the people who live in the East and see how they have been mistreated by the Sharia. Ruby, do you have any contact with your religious family or have they shunned you? They have shunned me in general. I have very minimum contact with them. And the contact is more because of my family fear for me. You know, they are not only fear for me, they fear for my safety and they're not happy with what I have done. They're not even happy for leaving my own spiritual house. If you leave a religion culture, it's leaving your identity. It's leaving everything. You are nothing without religion when you are a Muslim. This, for my family, it's like betrayal. Like, I have betrayed them. It sounds to me like you've found your identity. They say you've lost it, but it sounds to me like you've found, you've discovered so much more. You know what, Seth? I realize I've never been a follower. Go figure. You know, that... I just never caught that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a surprise. So I, always been... <laughs> so I always been my own person. You may have lost a family in one sense, but I know there are many people who are listening to the show who are considering you a member of their family. So you've gained so yeah. much more, and I hope you feel that. I hope you, uh, you realize you are not alone out there, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know. Here in Tucson, I have found so many like-minded from the Atheist Society, from the Skeptic Society, from the Thought Society, that really I feel like I found my family. Ruby, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to share your perspective and your story, and I wish you all the best down there in Tucson, okay? Thank you, Seth. I really appreciate it. Next up is a gentleman that you may have seen here and there at Free Thought events all around the country. He is very involved with the Free Thought movement and a, a very popular online secular community. Cesar Saeed al Mutar, thank you so much for being here. How you doing? Good, good. How are you doing yourself? I'm well. Now, you host a popular website. What is the website? Global Secular Humanist Movement. It became recently the media affiliate for the Global Secular Organizing and Strategy by Mr. Sean Falakroff. I'm working as his public relations director. Were you a practicing Muslim? Did you hold to the Quran? Did you worship Allah? What's your history? Well, I was raised in a comparatively liberal family by Iraqi standards. So I didn't have any religion force on me. So I've never really been a... I mean, in Iraq, since you are born, you are labeled a Muslim two minutes after you are born because your parents are Muslim. So the nation of Iraq labeled you, branded you a Muslim right off the bat. Yes, and you can never leave. Except that you did. How did that happen? Well, I mean, I left Iraq in uh, late 2009, and I got asylum in America in March 2013. I got the asylum based on the death of my eldest brother, who was killed by al-Qaeda in Iraq, as well as my cousin and my best friend. I'm sorry to hear about and your brother. He was killed by al-Qaeda. Yes. For what? Our Islamic Muslim Sunni militia. Uh, which is now controls many parts of Western Iraq and some parts of Syria. They have insane beliefs, extremely sectarian, extremely barbaric, and they would do anything for what they refer to as the global caliphate. 
the vision of them is that they want to establish a global Islamic empire. And they use places like Iraq, which is, as you know, fragile after the US intervention. And so the same can be said about Syria, to build their bases. The word Al-Qaeda means the base, technically. That is the translation. And uh, yeah, I mean, my brother was simply just going to work and he was kidnapped and killed with two of his friends. He was killed because he spoke out against Islam, against Al-Qaeda. What was the motivation? Did they ever reveal it? Not really. I mean, we don't know. I mean, here's the thing about Al-Qaeda. I mean, in my eyes, I still remember they beheaded an eight-year-old girl in front of my eyes because she was not covering her hair. So it's really hard to know what is the logic of these people. Except to strike fear into the hearts of everyone, everywhere. Exactly, exactly. That is the tool that they use, is to terrorize the population, and and they still do. I mean, they burn churches, they kill Christians, they kill atheists, they kill Shias especially. I mean, most of the suicide bombings in Iraq and Syria are done by them. And they actually believe what they say they believe. I mean, one of the craziest beliefs they have done, like I remember in Iraq, was that they said that if people are familiar with what the fatwa is, which is a religious ruling in Islam, they said that uh, salad is not allowed because a cucumber is a male and tomato is a female, and they should not be mixed together. And this is not a joke, by the way. They used to actually kill people in the grocery store for buying a tomato and a cucumber together because the female and the male cannot be mixed together. And if people want to check the source, they can see it on the Telegraph and the Washington Post. There is a full report on that. It does sound rather far-fetched. I mean, when you speak to some people who are defenders of Islam, they'll say you can't judge Islam by these extreme stories that are being fueled by the media, a sensationalist media who love controversy, who love blood and gore in the headlines. Islam is not really this way. Islam is genuinely a religion of peace. How would you respond to that? Well, obviously, the majority, I mean, when you criticize an element like this, obviously these people do not really represent the whole 1.7 billion people. But at the same time, there is a reason why such extremes exist within Islam. And I believe that even the moderates, the Islamic Muslim moderates, have created a smoke screen for Islamic terrorism to flourish. So whenever we, we criticize Islam, people will tell you, oh, well, this is not Islam. And if, if you look at what actually moderate Islam is, it's generally scriptural ignorance. I refer to them as cafeteria Muslims. So when you go to cafeteria, you don't actually choose the whole menu. You all pick a cookie and a coffee. So the quote-unquote, the moderate Muslims are always like scream, anybody who criticizes Islam is Islamophobic and stuff. If you talk to them about their religion, they don't really follow most of the religion. I mean, I've met a gay imam in New York City, actually. And I told him, like, how do you reconcile? In the Quran and the Hadith, it's pretty explicit that gays should be stoned to death. And then he said, like, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Then I told him, you are quoting Thomas Jefferson, not the Quran. It's like when you see in a Protestant Christian church a gay minister, a gay pastor, preaching a Bible that says that homosexuals deserve death. Exactly. But here's, I think, the main difference between the two segments. There are more moderate Christians than there are moderate Muslims. I mean, if people do the research and look at the statistics, there are nine countries that kill people for being atheists. Nine of them are Muslim-dominated. All of them. Leave aside women rights. The worst places to be a woman in the world are Muslim-dominated. Because Islam look at women as possessions, even if it does not say that, for example, honor killing, it does not endorse honor killing, but at the same time, it creates the culture that honor killing and stuff of that sort can occur. So I don't think there is a religion of peace anyway, but Islam is definitely not one. As I look from the outside in, I see a culture that oppresses people with terror and the threat of violence and death, people yearning to be free. I mean, would you agree that there are many, many, many people who are professing Islam publicly, 
But under the surface, they are desperate to get out. They're desperate to get free. They fear for their lives. They want to be emancipated and released from this sort of culture of bondage, correct? Exactly, yeah. I mean, there are some, yes. Okay, but if they cannot speak out and they cannot have their voices heard under penalty of torture or death, how do things change? How is it quelled? How do we counter it in these countries dominated by Islam? Well, that's a good question. I mean, one of the projects that I started is called Secular Post. I created kind of an open source journalism website in which people, especially for Muslim countries, they can upload their articles and communicate with each other and group with each other. I am definitely in favor of getting rid of the religion, but it's not really realistic at the moment. What we can advocate for would be to support the moderates now at the moment, even though, as I said, I'm not really a fan of them, but there isn't many people to talk to. Instead of trying to wipe it completely off of the map, perhaps incremental steps toward a more moderate religion might be a way to at least affect some positive change. Is that what you're trying to communicate? Yes, this to me needs to be the basics, because as Like, fundamentalist Islam does not believe in the freedom of religion, does not believe in freedom of speech, does not believe in any of the basic human rights, while moderate Muslims do, some of them. So we have to support these moderate voices, even though we disagree with them on issues regarding the the cosmos and the evolution, but they are still, I would call them the sort of the two evil. I mean, just like now what the situation in Syria is, you have tons of people fighting and killing each other, and you... You hardly can find any good guys that you can say, you know what, these are the groups that I agree with, they support human rights. You cannot find this group. So what you do is just to do a utilitarian argument and say, well, this person is better than this person. It's just not that I'm a fan, but he's, he's better. The lesser of two uh, evils. Yes. There seems to be a kind of black market of free thought on the Internet. This forbidden zone exactly. where people sort of sneak into the basement and boot up their computers and they use the Internet to express all the things that they cannot say in public. Yeah, I mean, there is a famous Facebook page that actually they hired me as their admin of. It's called the Enlightened Minds, Ashab al in Arabic. It has about 250,000 followers, which is all about spreading secularism and free thought in the Muslim world. Maria Namazi, if people are familiar with her, she's just starting a show that's going to be broadcasted to Middle Eastern countries. So that is a, especially within the young people, I mean, I can definitely speak for people in my generation, especially in Iraq, because of the civil war and the continuous killing between Sunnis and Shias. Many of the young people are actually going away from religion because they are seeing very bad effects. Same can be said about Iran. There was a huge birth of, like, it was a fatwa issued by Ayatollah Khomeini back then. And there are many young people in Iran at the moment. Majority of them are non-religious. And that's Iran, which is, it looks on the TV as an Islamic theocracy, etc., etc. But they don't really, the Ayatollahs don't really have much time if they don't water down their extremism. And you can see their new prime minister, the Rouhani, has a watered-down version of Islam compared to the person before him. Because many people who are young are starting to vote, so they voted for a more moderate voice. So yeah, there is hope for free thought in the Middle East. It's just, it's going to take much longer in the Middle East than it's going to take in America or Western Europe. Is there a difference between being Islamic and being a Muslim? Well, Islamist is the political, the person who believes that Islam can be the official religion of the state. Muslim is the person who believes in Islam. Not all Muslims are Islamists. I'm guilty of interchanging the two, right? I'll say, well, you're an Islamist or you're a Muslim, and you're saying they are not identical. They're not the same things necessarily. No, they're not the same. I mean, you can be a Muslim and a secular, but yes, these voices are not really common. I mean, uh, one of the famous parties in Iraq led by Allah, he's a Muslim guy, but he believes in the separation of mosque and state. So he's a Muslim, but not an Islamist. How can you be a secular Muslim if Muslims believe in Islam? 
Was that? The, I mean, is that the declaration well, you made? Well, I mean, if you cherry pick the religion, you can't be a second Muslim. <laughs> is it that they embrace the traditions of the Muslim yeah. faith, but don't necessarily hold to the God, to the deity? They enjoy the practices and traditions. Secular Muslim is not the same as secular Jew. I mean, secular Muslim is a pretty much like a liberal Christian. I mean, he still believes in God, but not really fundamentalist about it. I mean, he does not force his daughter to wear a headscarf or... So, like, and some of the people who became secular Muslims mainly because they love their religion so much. So they think because the humans are corrupt, they don't want people to use Islam as the religion of the state. So it's a uh, different terminology. I, I always joke about it when I mention like this between secularism in America and Iraq. And I say that getting stoned in America means something else than getting stoned in the Middle East. So, <laughs> so the same thing. Yeah, getting, getting stoned, especially in the states that are legalizing marijuana. <laughs> <is definitely> <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> exactly. You realize how it's confusing to those of us who are trying to figure all this out, right? If you say secular, we're thinking you are deity free, but a secular Muslim actually believes in God. They're more of a moderate, but a moderate Christian isn't the same as a moderate Muslim. I mean, it does become very confusing when you throw these labels around. Do you find that's often the case? People have a hard time understanding if they weren't born into it. As a person who, who I've been to both sides of the world, I mean, I've been to many countries in the Middle East and now in America, I'm traveling so much. Yes, I mean, there is a huge time gap between the two sides of the world. person can criticize the Christianity all the way, but Christianity got this period of the enlightenment that have kind of watered down Christianity. At what, I mean, Christianity that we see today is different than the Christianity of the medieval ages. The difference is Islam of the 21st century is the Christianity of the medieval ages. Wow. And the difference is they have the 21st century weapons. So that's why you see all this news filled with killing and bombing, because one person can do much more effect today than he can do 500 years ago. I mean, even in the UK, the Muslims who live in the UK, and people may assume that when people who have Islamic faith, when they immigrate to a Western country, their religion may be watered down. But in the UK, about 60% plus of the Muslims who live in the UK believe that there should be penalty for people leaving Islam. That is in the UK. They believe that there should be a penalty for apostasy. The moderate voices, the reformers in Islam are much less in numbers than they are in Christianity. I mean, I, I'm not saying that Christianity is a benign religion. I don't want people to interpret it this way. But Christianity has evolved in a much faster rate than Islam is. That's why I was talking about the moderates. We should encourage these reforms to happen because it's dangerous to hold a belief from the 6th century and you have a nuclear weapon like Iran or Pakistan. It's dangerous. 21st century weaponry and technology can maximize this. And when people have crazy beliefs like the Ayatollah, one of the Ayatollahs of Iran said if, he, if we killed 6 million Jews and the Jews attacked back, the 50 million Iranians will go to heaven and the 6 million Jews will go to hell. So they welcome death. Yes. So if, if you have people believe in such crazy apocalyptic beliefs, this is dangerous. And uh, I mean, 9-11 is a very example of, of when people actually believe what they say they believe. There is a uh, poster on your Facebook page that I saw that uh, I just love the quote. It says, if it can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. Exactly. Yes, that's Carl Sagan. Everything must be tested. Everything must be challenged and questioned. And the more they tell us we cannot ask the question, the more we should ask the question. Exactly. And if they find the question offensive, we find their religion offensive. Thank you for the work you're doing at the uh, Global Secular Humanist page. With your permission, I'll link that page in the description box of this video. Would the Facebook page be the best one to link to? Yes, and also the website globalsecular.org. Global Secular. Dot yes. Org. Thank you so much for your perspective. You're a great spokesperson for free thought. You inspire a lot of people and you've educated us today, certainly. Thank you for your time and for your input. Greatly appreciated. You are welcome. Have a great day. Now, I realize here at the end of this show that there were going to be many who will have heard the testimonies and the stories of people who had left Islam and sent in their letters. And they'll say, you got it all wrong. You stack the deck. 
and you misrepresented what Islam is. And I realize that religion has nuance. All religions have their nuances everywhere you go. Every culture treats it a little bit differently. You're going to find different flavors of whether it's Islam, Christianity, whatever. But one cannot see the sheer volume of these stories coming from the apostate, from the ex-Muslim, to hear about the oppression and the quelling of human rights and the imprisoning of the mind and the heart and just blow it off, brush it off and say it doesn't exist. There's something here, something very serious. And as this is the second most popular religion in the world, it's something that must be addressed. And if you are someone who is sort of trapped in a culture, Muslim or otherwise, an oppressive religious environment where you feel like you have no voice, I understand that your path out is a long and difficult one in many cases. But I want to remind you that you are not alone, that the tide for reason is rising. Thanks to the internet especially, you can find people of like mind who will understand and support you. Thanks to organizations like the Council of Ex-Muslims and the Global Secular Humanist Movement and so many others, you have a place to go, even anonymously, where you can have a voice and be heard and be understood. And be encouraged, because even though change often happens extremely slowly and extremely painfully, I'm convinced the change is inevitable, positive change. These prehistoric, primitive ideas, they have no place to go, but ultimately into obsolescence. They are obsolete. They should be, and ultimately it is my hope they will be, done away with. And the individual will be celebrated, challenge and curiosity, and exploration of our world and universe will be encouraged. And we as a species, in that way, will have evolved just a little bit more. Thank you so much for listening tonight. Next Tuesday night, atheism. Is it just another religion? We hear this charge a lot, and we're going to address it Tuesday night next week. I will see you right here on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com